We now want to turn our attention to the Word of God. Uh, we, for those that are visiting, visiting us and uh, that are new here at Nairobi Chapel, we have been going through a series that we titled Vaccinated Church. And we are looking specifically at the book of 1 Corinthians, one of the most elaborate letters that Paul wrote to the church. And the reason we've titled it Vaccinated Church is we're looking at the various viruses that Paul brings out that can potentially destroy the church. There are many viruses that can destroy the church. But something amazing Paul shares with us is many vaccines that the church can ensure it's healthy, to help the church ensure it's healthy. So the first virus we looked at uh, as we began this series was a virus of compartments the virus of compartments from chapter 1 to chapter 4. Last Sunday, we looked at the virus of compromise, the virus of compromise. Today, we're going to look at the virus of competition. And next Sunday, we're going to close with the virus of complexity. And right next to each of these viruses, there's the vaccine that Paul prescribes in Scripture, the vaccine of unity to be able to take care of compartments, the vaccine of maturity, spiritual maturity to take care of compromise. Today we are looking at the vaccine of charity, love, that takes care of competition, and we look at the vaccine of brevity. All right, so let's look at competition uh, today, the virus of competition. We are now on chapter 9, but let me begin with chapter 8, because from chapter 8 onwards of 1 Corinthians, Paul shifts his attention from responding to the answers, sorry, responding to the questions that the Corinthian church had asked him, and he begins to address the issue of corporate worship, the dynamics of their worship together. From chapter 8 all the way to chapter 14, we see him addressing different elements of corporate worship. We already saw that in the first seven chapters, he was responding to some concerns or issues in the church. From chapter 7, he now begins to answer some questions that the church had asked. But he focuses his answers from chapter 8 all the way to chapter 14 to issues that affected corporate worship. From chapter 8, we see him forbidding the Corinthians to eat meat that was specifically prepared in the temple, the temple meals that were offered. He uh, specifically forbade the Christians or the members of the church in Corinth to partake from those meals, but he allowed them to partake of meat that was sold in the marketplaces because they were arguing about meat that was dedicated to pagan gods. He then goes ahead to continue to deal with an issue that was a big issue in the church during that time. He moves from, um, you know, this outward, you know, consumption of meat, and he looks at something that affects the social decorum of the members of the church. He specifically addressed the issue of headdress or head coverings for the women that were part of the con congregation. And he addresses this issue because that was a cultural issue at that particular time, and he hones in and focuses his attention on that. Now he moves from the outward, the meat they were consuming, and the how they were dressing. He now moves to inward issues of worship. And he addresses in chapter 11 the issue of the Lord's Supper and how they should partake the Lord's table in an honorable and in a respectable way. He moves further inward in chapter 12 and he spends the next three chapters, chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14 on an issue that today I will address because Paul spends a lot of time addressing this same issue, the issue of spiritual gifts and how the Holy Spirit operates within the body of Christ. So today I'm going to focus on what I sense is what, what Paul bro brings out as the most important issue that was facing the church in Corinth, where their worship is concerned, is how the Holy Spirit operates in their midst through the spiritual gifts that God has given the body of Christ. So today I'll focus my attention on spiritual gifts, and I'd like us to zero in on this issue because Paul specifically brings it out as a very important issue. Spiritual gifts. 
What are spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts are divine, divine gifts, divine abilities that are specifically distributed by the Holy Spirit to every believer according to God's design for the common good of the body of Christ. Now let's keep up that definition in a bit. They are distributed by the Holy Spirit. They are given by God. They are gifts. It's not something I earn. It is something that God gives me. It is something the Holy Spirit grants you and I. They are distributed by the Holy Spirit to every believer. Now, spiritual gifts are only given to believers. God gives gifts and talents and abilities to all of us from birth. But spiritual gifts are given to believers because they are for a particular function. And the Bible is clear. It is God's design that they be used to edify the body of Christ, to serve others, and to present the body of Christ as God desired for the body of Christ to be. It's for the common good of the body of Christ. It's not for my good. It's not for your good. It's for the good of the body of Christ. That is, God has given this gift through me to the body. It's important to understand the purpose and the function of spiritual gifts. Now, every single believer upon salvation, every single believer, because upon salvation, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the one that Jesus promised us to be able to establish the church, to be with us even after he ascended to heaven, but Upon receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit distributes his gifts to every believer. Upon salvation, when I receive the gift of the promised Holy Spirit, then God grants me gifts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every single believer has a gift. It's explicitly written in Scripture. Each one of you has your own gift from God. One has one gift. The other one has another, 1 Corinthians 7.7. 7. Each one of us should use our gifts for the purposes of edifying others, serving others, and building up the body of Christ. 1 Peter 4.10. None of us has all the gifts. That's why we need each other. None of us has all these gifts. And God designed it so that the body of Christ is designed in such a way that we need each other. And it's God who decides. God decides. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the work of one and the same Spirit, it is He who distributes to each one. It is the Holy Spirit. It is God that decides. Now, in the Scriptures, there are four passage, passages in Scripture that talk about spiritual gifts. This passage we're about to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is one of them. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 has a list of nine gifts. Romans chapter 12 has a list of gifts. 1 Peter chapter 4 has a list of gifts. And finally, we see in Scripture, Ephesians chapter 4 has a list of gifts. Together in Scripture, together all these passages list down 21 different gifts that God has granted to the body of Christ. Now just to help us, you can categorize all these gifts into three broad categories. The first one is speaking gifts. The second one is service gifts. And the third one is sign gifts. All these gifts in Scripture can be placed in one of those categories. Speaking gifts are gifts like words of wis word of wisdom, prophecy, evangelism, pastor, teacher, teaching. All these are gifts around or that can be categorized as speaking gifts. The second category is service gifts. These are administration, exhortation, faith, giving, helps, serving, mercy. And then there are sign gifts. Gifts like dis distinguishing of spirits, miracles, healings, tongues, interpretation. Now keep that slide up for a minute. I want you to look at that slide. And I want you to identify which gift you sense and you feel that you have. Which stands out for you as it defines you more? Which gift have you found yourself exercising? Or which gift have you found yourself practicing? Which gift do you find yourself expressing with ease? Because everyone here has a gift. God has distributed these gifts 
to us. Now, let me put it differently. Today is um, Father's Day, and maybe this evening there's a special meal that we find ourselves invited to. And that special meal has a buffet, and uh, there, there are different, you know, different types of food. And we find ourselves in a line, and we are serving this food in the buffet. And you find the person in front of you is serving. The gentleman goes ahead and serves and serves and serves. When he gets to the end of the buffet, unfortunately, as he's serving, by mistake, he's, he slips and he falls, but he manages to pick himself up before he gets to the ground. But unfortunately, the plate does what? It falls to the ground, and all the food spills. Now, have you ever spilled food? Or have you ever dropped a plate? Um, some of us remember high school, because that's when it's most painful. <laughs> yeah? When your plate falls, and that special meal, uh, you know, you spill that special meal. But uh, I'm just trying to use this illustration to communicate something. If you are standing behind the person who, uh, um, you know, who uh, unfortunately tripped and their plate fell, and their food spilled all over, and maybe there are two people behind you and there are two people in front of you, I want to suggest to us that how you respond to the food falling is a reflection of probably the gift that you have. Okay? Now, walk with me here. If the person in front of the person whose food dropped had the gift of prophecy, what do you think he would have said? What do you think he would have said? He probably would have said, I saw it coming. <laughs> you know, the way you are serving, I saw it coming. The way you walk, I saw it coming. If the person behind him had the gift of service, what do you think they would have said? Don't worry, don't worry. I'll help you clean it up. I'm here. I'll help you clean it up. In fact, they'll put their plate on the side very quickly and quickly help them clean it up. If the next person had the gift of teaching, what do you think they would have said? They probably would have turned to the gentleman whose food had fallen and said, you know what, next time, hold the plate, okay? Hold the plate on either side. And the likelihood that this plate is going to fall is going to be, yeah. Then what if the next person had the gift of wisdom? The gift of wisdom they probably would have analyzed how, or the gift of knowledge, analyzed how the plate fell, okay? So maybe the plate fell, the plate fell because you put too much chicken and beef on one side, and you just put salad on the other side, and this side was heavier <laughs> than the other, and that's probably why it fell. What if the person had the gift of exhortation? What do you think they would have said? They would have said, don't worry, it happens. In fact, let me tell you, look at this. At least none of the food spilt on you. At least all the food is on the, the ground. Your clothes are okay. You know, you're still clean. You're fine. Don't worry, don't worry. That's probably the gift of exhortation. What if you had the gift of giving? What do you think the person with the gift of giving would have said? By the way, have mine, have mine. It's okay, by the way, you can have mine. I, I really... I, I had eaten earlier on. I don't have much of a, you know, I'm not that hungry. If they had the gift of mercy, they probably would have told him, don't feel too bad. It could have happened to anyone. I mean, anyone in this line would have tripped. If someone in that line had the gift of administration, what do you think they would have said? If they had the gift of administration, they probably would have quickly said, where is the mop? Okay, you go and get it. There is another, let's get the pieces. You pick up these pieces. They would have given and delegated tasks and responsibilities to people. They would have already cordoned off the area and stopped the line and told the rest, please don't come, there's drama up ahead, ETC. That's the gift of administration. And finally, I mean, we could go on and on, eh? but you get the point. Uh, the gift of faith, if someone had the gift of faith, what do you think they would have said? They probably would have looked at that gentleman and told him, I declare that this is the last time it's going to happen in your life. 
The point is this. We are all gifted differently. And that's why we act differently. That's why we serve differently. We respond differently. That God has uniquely gifted us differently. And Paul brings it out very, very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the passage I'd like to kindly request that we read. Um, we're going to read a few verses, but I'm going to request us to read uh, further in your own time uh, to the rest of this amazing chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's just look at a few verses from verse 4 to verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, all right? Uh, let's, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 4. Let's read together. I'll be reading from the NIV. There are different kinds of gifts, but, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God that is at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And these are the... And, sorry, and still to another interpretation of tongues. And these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Verse 12 says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Let me say that again. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. In this passage, we see Paul mentioning nine of the 21 or, or more gifts that are listed in Scripture, and he mentions the gift of wisdom. Many of us know this is the gift of application of God's knowledge to solve problems and issues of our time. The gift of knowledge, the ability to search God's word, the ability to understand the depths of the truths in God's word. The gift of faith, the ability to perceive, the ability to believe God to do great and mighty things. There's a gift of healing that is mentioned here. And you need to notice the gift of healing mentioned here, the word is in plural, meaning it's beyond physical healing. It is physical healing. It's psychological healing. It is spiritual healing. It is emotional healing. So anyone that has the gift of healing could operate in allowing healing to happen in any of those areas. M miraculous powers, the ability to release the power of God and realize the power of God in very difficult situations, to see the supernatural happening. The gift of prophecy. Many of us think the gift of prophecy is just the ability to foretell the future. No, the gift of prophecy is both the ability to foretell the future, but also to foretell, to declare, to foretell the Word of God, to proclaim the Word of God, and to unpack the amazing truth of the Word of God, or to be able to reveal the mind of God. Distinguishing between spirits, the ability to discern and to detect false doctrine. And he finally mentions tongues, and interpretation of the tongues, the ability to speak in this uh, heavenly language, but also the ability to interpret these tongues. These are the gifts that we see Paul mentioning in Scripture. What I'd like us to notice is Paul is actually speaking to a very vibrant church, to a church that was exercising a diversity of these gifts. These gifts were robust in the church in Corinth. These gifts were operating in the church in Corinth. And he mentions to them and specifically calls them out, not because of the vibrance of their gifts, but the Corinthian church had made the same mistake that I mentioned in chapter 1, that they made where teachers that were teaching among them was concerned, they began to exalt one teacher over the other, and they allowed their preference for one teacher to make the others look inferior. 
And they had begun to do exactly the same thing now with spiritual gifts. They had started exalting one gift over the other, allowing their preference for one gift or their exaltation for one gift to put other people down that did not have this gift. And it began to cause discord in the church, division in the church, because they had aligned themselves around the gifts of their preference or the gifts that they had. The body of church, the body of Christ, the church, was failing to benefit from the robust variety and diversity of gifts because people were begin to, beginning to fight one with the other around which gift someone has. In fact, there's one particular gift, one particular gift that was causing trouble, a lot of trouble in the church, the gift of tongues. And there are some people at that particular time there were some people in the church in Corinth that had made it a criteria for someone to become a Christian is that they can exercise the gift of tongues. They can practice the gift of tongues. There were many people that were being sidelined simply because they did not have the gift of tongues or were not able to operate in the gift of tongues. And the same thing that was happening there, then in Corinth, still happens today. They wanted the entire church to speak in tongues, and yet God had granted a diversity of gifts to the body of Christ. Historically, this issue of tongues has been controversial. It was controversial in Pentecost. It was controversial in Corinth. It is still controversial today in the church. There are millions of Christians today that speak in tongues, and they are found in all churches. They are found in Catholic churches. They are found in mainstream denominations. They are found in independent churches. They are found in evangelical churches. They are found in Pentecostal churches. There are Christians all over that exercise this gift of tongues. However, like Corinth, what has happened in many churches is that they have be there has become an unhealthy emphasis has been placed on this one gift. An unhealthy emphasis has been placed on this gift, making other Christians feel inferior simply because they do not practice this gift. In fact, you need to notice that in the scriptures that Paul only mentions this gift three times, three times in the scriptures. We see it clearly mentioned here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 mentions it. We see earlier on it's mentioned in Mark where the gift of tongues is mentioned. In the book of Acts, we see it only mentioned three times. Total of five times in the New Testament. There is no other epistle of Paul where the gift of tongues is mentioned. And Paul, for some reason, did not exalt this gift above all the others. Why have we today exalted this gift and made others look and feel inferior simply because they do not exercise and operate the, um, in the gift of tongues. And if you're here today, if you're worshiping with us online this afternoon, if you're here today and you don't speak in tongues, I want to confidently tell you what Paul would have told you even through the scriptures. You are not a second-class Christian. You are not a second-class Christian. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit have God's trademark. All of them. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit have God's seal. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit equally have God's approval and equally have the same emphasis within the scriptures. And it's important for us to understand. The Bible says they are all from the same spirit. They are all from the same God. There is none that is exalted above all the, the rest. We are one body. But that one body has many parts. And each part of the body of Christ is vital. Every single part of the body is important. It is important. Whether I speak in tongues or not, whether I exercise mercy or not, whether I'm gifted in administration or not, everybody that has whichever gift and is faithfully using that gift is valuable and is important to God. The Spirit has given each and every one of these gifts according to His wisdom. And God has granted these gifts to the body of Christ. And it's only when all these gifts are put together that you see the church. 
It's only when these gifts are allowed to operate freely in the body of Christ that we become the church. We become the church when these gifts that God has granted the church are not put down, but these gifts are enabled. These gifts are encouraged to operate within the body of Christ. I'm here to declare there, is, there are no insignificant members in the body of Christ. There are no insignificant gifts in the body of Christ. And that's exactly what Paul would tell us. Every single one of you is a vital part of the body of Christ. Every single one of you is a core important element within the body of Christ. And it's only then that we can become the church. It's only then we can see the amazing picture, like a jigsaw puzzle that has so many parts. It's only when every single one of you has fit in their place and is exercising their gift freely and well that we see the amazing picture of the body of Christ. Now, Paul highlights the problem. And he said there was one problem where these gifts are concerned. There is one problem, and that problem is competition. The church had allowed competition to grow among the gifts that God has granted the body of Christ. And it is this competition that became a virus for the church. And this is what Paul addresses and he speaks to. And today I suggest this is exactly what God would like to call us out on as the body of Christ. You know, we are all used to competition. We are all used to competition. We faced competition we have literally faced it throughout our lives. We faced it when we were born, into the families that we were born into, in the homes that we are in. We faced it at home between our brothers and our sisters. We faced it in school between us and our schoolmates, uh, competition for grades, competition for various activities, school activities. We have faced it all along in our lives. And even now, we compete, even now. We compete where our hobbies are concerned. We compete in traffic. We compete for vaccines. We compete for promotion. And I could go on and on and on to talk about the ways that we find ourselves competing with each other, trying to outdo the other, trying to go ahead of the other. The world that we live in is a world that exalts and glorifies competition. Competition, for most of us, is a way of life. It's where we find ourselves today. And because it is natural to compete, so what is more natural for us than to literally carry over competition from the spaces that we're in to the church? We do the most natural thing. We translate what we're experiencing in the world and we bring it to the church. And we continue to compete even in the context of the church. So I don't like the same music as you do. So because I don't like the same music as you do, then we're in competition. Because I don't pray using the same words as you use or the same style as you pray, so we're in competition. Because I don't serve in the same ministry as you do and I'm not gifted in the same way as you, so we are in competition. And we become obsessed with who is right, who is ahead of the other, who is doing better than the other, who is more important than the other. And this is a challenge that Paul is giving us as a church. As long as we view the church as one more place for competition, then the Holy Spirit can never reign among us. He can never reign among us when we're trying to outdo each other and prove ourselves over another. Then what Paul is saying is the workings and the giftings of the Holy Spirit will never be seen in our midst because we want to be seen, because we are trying to put forth our own agenda. And if we view the church as just another place for competition, Paul, using the analogy of the body, tells us that previously the body of Christ was designed. The body of Christ was designed to be complete, as you see in front of us, with a head, with hands. He uses the image of the physical body. 
And he says the body of Christ was designed to be complete. It was designed to be a perfect picture of completion. But what happens is this. Our competition, our desire to allow our own preference to have its way, to allow what is important to us, not what is important to God, to have its way. What this does is basically, as we compete, what Paul is telling us is we begin to amputate the body of Christ. In fact, using Paul's analogy of the different members of the body of Christ, what we begin to do is we begin to dismember the body of Christ. And we pick up one gift and say this gift is more important than the rest. And we say, no, it's the gift of prophecy that is more important than the other gifts that God has granted the body of Christ. This looks abnormal. It doesn't look like a body. And what we have at the end of the day is far from the image of the body of Christ as Christ intended. As we continue with what is important to us and what we prefer, we continue to dismember the body of Christ. And what we leave at the end of the day, and because of time, I mean, you have the image. What we leave is a deformed version of the body of Christ, simply because of our competition, our lack of understanding around the complementarity of every individual and every gift that is represented here. In fact, as a church, we go even a step further. We fall into the trap of deciding for God who should belong to the body. Who should belong? Who qualifies to belong to the body of Christ based on our own judgment, based on our own analysis of people? We now begin to compete even around who deserves to be in the body of Christ more than the other. And Paul appeals to the church as he appeals to us as Nairobi Chapel today, give up competing with one another. In fact, Paul gives us a challenge and he says, if only I could accept my limitations where my gift is concerned so that another person could exercise their gift and that gift is able to be a blessing to me. Accept the limitations of your gift so that the other person can exercise their gift. And finally, the larger body can profit and benefit from this gift. Paul gives us a solution for competition. He gives us a solution for this deformed body that the body of Christ has become. And at the end of the chapter we read, chapter 12, the last statement he makes is this, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Paul introduces the solution for a deformed body based on our competition around gifts. And he says the most excellent way is the way of love. Because by I not just merely exercising my gift, but by I recognizing that my gift is designed to worship God and my gift is designed to serve others, I cease making my gift the end in and of itself. And I recognize that there's something greater than my gift. There's something more important than my spiritual gift. And that I am just a tool of worship. I am a tool for service. And at the end of the day, as I worship God with my love for God, and as I serve others with my love for others, ultimately that's the most excellent way. Operating and arguing at this level is a failure where the, church, where the church is concerned. And at the end of the day, we miss the mark if we do not subscribe to this more excellent way. Gifts are a subject of our diversity, but love is the object of our unity. Love is the most excellent way. And at the end of the day, if our gifts lead us to love God and to love others, our gifts have fully accomplished what God had purposed for our gifts to accomplish. In fact, in chapter 13, the chapter we all know and we call the love chapter, the chapter of love that breaks down this most excellent way well, 
The approach that Paul chose to take in describing love is he identifies what the people in Corinth regarded most important. Greeks, in this great Greek city of Corinth, regarded highly the ability to speak eloquently, the ability to speak persuasively. The Greeks regarded someone or admired someone that had great oratory skills, the ability to hold an audience spellbound, the ability or the power of spoken word was highly regarded in Corinth. So Paul uses something that was highly regarded to tell them or to communicate to them this most excellent way. And he says, if you speak with tongues as of angels, if you can eloquently be able to speak so well, then he says, if you do not have love, even though you can speak better than anyone else and you don't have love, he says, you're a noisemaker. You're a noisemaker. And he says, the most excellent thing is love. It's even greater than the thing that we hold and regard greatest as a church, even at the church in Corinth. Without love, even the greatest orator is just a noisemaker. That's what he's saying. And he's saying for us, Regardless what gift you have, if that gift does not serve something greater, if that gift does not represent something greater than the gift, then it is useless. He says it is in vain. It is nothing. Because gifts are a means to an end. And Paul says the end is love. Gifts are a means to an end. The end is love. If these gifts do not communicate God's love, then they are nothing and they are baseless at the end of the day. In fact, he uses an illustration to describe what was happening in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, he mentions a verse we all probably know because in all rite of passage programs, when boys are becoming men and when we are transitioning them, this is the verse they quote. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, at the end of this love chapter, he says this, I put the childish ways behind me. And what he's saying is this. He says, whenever a child acts like a child, then there's nothing wrong. Whenever a child is childish, there's nothing wrong. But when an adult starts acting like a child, that's where there's a problem. And he tells the church, you have, you have begun to act like children. Because many of you know, when you give a child a, a, a gift, if there were 10 children here, and I gave each of the children a gift, one child starts playing with the gift that they're given, and very soon the child realizes that other child has another gift and loses interest in their gift and starts going to grab the next gift. And very soon, the excitement around the gift they have been given ends because they start desiring another gift and that begins to result in a squabble and a fight and finally none of the children know which gift they were given because they have fought over the gift they have been given and at the end of the day that's what happened to the church and Paul is telling the church we are squabbling over gifts that God has given you and you've lost sight of the gift and the value and the importance of the gift that God has given you and we are squabbling desiring somebody else's gift, you're thinking about somebody else's gift instead of allowing the gift that God has given you to be maximized in the body. The point he's making is, as our capacity to love grows, it begins to replace our concern for spiritual gifts. If we subscribe to something greater than the gifts that God has given us, then we are able at the end of the day to put spiritual gifts in their rightful place. This was happening in the church. They were initially thrilled with the gifts that God has given them. Very soon they started envying and competing with one another about the differences between their gifts. Instead of allowing the differences in these gifts to guide them to make the church look more beautiful. And Paul is telling the church, as he's telling us today, if only we were not childishly focused on gifts, if only we were not childishly focused on gifts, if only we were adult and maturely focused on love, the object of this gift is to communicate 
God's love. Let our diversity decorate us instead of separate us. Let our diversity decorate us. Present us as a church with beauty. Present us as a church with diversity. Present us as a church the way God wants us to be and not separate us. Gifts are just a roadmap. The destination, the destination is love. Love is the destination. That's why at the end of this amazing uh, chapter, chapter 13, the chapter of love, Paul says, and the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. The end goal is not competition. The end goal is completion. Completion. The end goal is completion, not competition. The end goal is not a deformed body because we are all competing on which part of the body is important. The end goal is completion of the body of Christ. The beauty of the picture of the church should come out complete because each of us have submitted one to the other to operate in our gifts and to serve one another. But when we focus on our spiritual gifts, it results in competition. But when we focus on love, focus on love, it results in completion. When we focus on something greater than our spiritual gifts, then the body of Christ looks complete because we've looked beyond the things that make us different. The challenge I want to give us as I close today is many of us are sitting back. Today or in the past year, you're sitting back and you're not serving actively within the body of Christ right here in Nairobi Chapel. Many of us worshiping with us online are sitting back and you're not actively serving maybe because you think you don't have anything to offer and I've guaranteed and assured you that you're gifted, that God has placed in you something that he desires for you to use within the body of Christ. Maybe it's because you don't think you have something to offer or some people here probably think because you walked in today and some ushers received you, because you uh, worshipped the Lord in singing today and there was a worship team leading in worship, because there are many within our production booth, there are many manning the cameras, there are many uh, when you took your child to the Quest facility, there was a teacher in the classroom to receive your child. There were volunteers to sign you in because you have seen that every part of the body of Christ has somebody, then you think that you don't have a place. I'm here to tell you, those people are already doing what God has gifted them to do. Their piece of the puzzle is already there. God is waiting for you to also fill in your piece of the puzzle. Your piece of the puzzle that is Nairobi Chapel is empty because you have not stepped up to fill in that piece. And my greatest desire is for us not to have an incomplete, deformed body, but for us today to take up the challenge and to say, I will ensure that my piece in the puzzle of Nairobi Chapel is never empty because I am serving God. You are equally important. It's, the worship team needs more worship team members because there is other gifts of worship in our midst. Every single one of us has a gift. Your gift is not being used, and God wants you to step up and to use that gift. Each of us was given a card when you walked in, and it's written, Service Opportunities. And the reason why we listed a few opportunities at the back, those are the ones we desperately are in need of. Those areas are in deep need. And today, if any of those areas at the back of that card resonates with you, kindly sign up. We have a desk at the back. It's our volunteer sign-up desk. Please sign up and say, I'm willing to serve in this area. But it's not limited to those areas we've listed at the back of the card. Because there are so many areas that are in need of you to step into even today. So any other area, maybe you're not quite clear about the area, but you're available to fill in the gap that God has for you to fill in. Please sign up at the back at the end of the service. But I'd like us to appreciate and to know what your commitment today will do. In signing up today, 
in making a commitment to serve today, what you're basically doing is you're making a commitment to make the body of Christ look the way God intended it to look in the first place. When I removed one member of um, this body right here, if you remove one part from someone's body, what's the English word? You have done what to, you have dismembered, right? You've dismembered it. But as we prepare to share in the Lord's table, I'd like to explain to you what your commitment does. Paul earlier on in 1 Corinthians 11 said, do this, share the Lord's table in remembrance of me. In remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross. In remembrance of God's love for us. He says, share the Lord's table in remembrance of that. Of what God did for you and I. But I want to suggest to us, just to extend that image a bit. Our not actively participating in the church, our not filling our gap in the piece of the puzzle, dismembers the body of, of Christ. But when you make a commitment today to serve and to fill the part, to attach your part to the body and actively function the way God has called you to function, what you're doing is you are remembering the body of Christ. You're remembering yourself to the body of Christ. Just the same way we'll celebrate the love of God through communion and what Christ did. And by your commitment today, what you're doing is you're restoring the form that God wanted the body of Christ to look. You're restoring the completeness of the body. As you remember yourself to the body in actively serving and participating in the part that God has given you to play, you are restoring the complete picture and the complete form that God desires for the church to be. Your commitment helps the body of Christ look the way God intended it in the first place. And as we remember the sacrifice of Christ through communion today, I want to challenge you to remember yourself to the body of Christ. To reconnect yourself. To re-establish yourself in the part that God has called you to play. So that at the end of the day, the image and the picture of the body of Christ is complete. And just to assure you, there are so many blessings in serving God. There are so many blessings in serving God. Just very quickly in conclusion, just before we share the Lord's table, let me just share with us very quickly some blessings of serving God. One is, and I've just titled them under the word serve so that we can remember. S is significance. Significance. By serving God in the body of Christ right here, you're fulfilling God's purpose for your life. You're giving your life greater significance. You're giving your life the opportunity to make a difference in other people's lives by serving God right here in the body of Christ. E stands for exercise. As you walk in obedience to accept the challenge to serve God this morning, what you're doing is you're saying, I am making a commitment to discover, to use, and to perfect my spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are like a muscle. The more you use them, the more you exercise them, the better, the stronger it becomes. The third one is R for reflect. As you serve among us, you're making a commitment to reflect Christ. You're being used as a tool. You're, you're a vessel where you diminish and you humbly diminish and let Christ be sh shine forth from your life. You begin to be a declarer of the kingdom of God. You begin to display Christ even as you serve him. The next one is V, village. When you commit to serve, if you join a ministry or one of our ministry initiatives here, you have a community that you serve with. If you choose to be a volunteer in one of our uh, you know, uh, ministries or in Quest, then you have a community around you of those that are serving alongside you. You now get a village, a community to love you, a community to serve alongside you. 
a community to be able to exalt God with. And finally, E is for expand. Expand. You grow and you deepen your faith. You grow and you deepen your relationship with God. The, the, the opportunity to serve allows you to reap great blessings before God because God blesses you because you're faithful. He that is faithful with little, a lot more will, entr will be entrusted. God begins to entrust a lot into your life because you offered yourself to serve. You begin to expand in every way, blessings-wise, but you also begin to expand and deepen your relationship with God as you serve. There is a blessing of service. And today I want to dedicate our communion to a commitment to remember the body of Christ, to reconnect your peace, that missing peace. I'd like you to get the opportunity to state before God that I will never have my peace missing in the puzzle of Nairobi Chapel. I will serve in the place that God has called me to serve. The body of Christ will not look deformed because I have played my role within the body of Christ as a representation of what it took, as a representation of what it took for you and I to be part of the body of Christ, I'd like to ask us now to prepare to share in the Lord's table and to tell God thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross so that I can be part of this body. So I'm going to kindly request that you hold your elements. We're going to share them in a bit. Those that are worshiping with us online, if you could now prepare your elements, we're going to partake together. The worship team will lead us in a song. I'd like this song to be a song of reflection. I'd like this song to be a song of commitment. I'd like to give us the opportunity to go before God and tell God, yes, I will remember my place in the body of Christ. I will remember the vital role that you have called me to play in the body of Christ. And today I make a commitment to serve. I make a commitment to serve, to exercise my spiritual gifts, but also make a commitment to God to say, I'm not going to squabble over gifts. I'm going to look at the, the more excellent way, the way of love that God has called us to serve together. So I'm going to kindly request that we bow our heads. I will take a minute or two um, just to be able to reflect and to respond to God's word in prayer. Go ahead and pray in your heart. Let God hear your commitment. Let God hear the, 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 the commitment that you're making even this day. So kindly go ahead and make that commitment in prayer. And so, Lord, as we share in the Lord's table, receive our commitment to you, receive our declaration to you that we desire for the body of Christ to look complete, not deformed, for the body of Christ to reflect what you desire for it to reflect. We recommit to service. We recommit to play our part. We recommit to the more excellent way, the way of love that was displayed by you when you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins and to purchase us into salvation. We thank you for paying the price for our salvation and we thank you for inviting us to be part of the body of Christ because of that sacrifice. And it is that sacrifice that we celebrate today. Amen. Amen. I'm going to kindly request that you peel off the top cover of your pre-packed communion elements. If you could peel it off, and if you could pick out um, the wafer, and then after that, if you could peel off the lower part, so that you could also uh, prepare yourself to take the drink. 
Um, just peel off both sections so that you're ready and you're prepared so that as we partake of the Lord's table, you're ready. Those that are worshiping with us online, if you could prepare your elements right now and prepare yourself to partake of the Lord's table with us. Amen. On the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that was broken for you. Take it in remembrance of me. Shall we together partake of the bread? And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Each time you drink of this cup and you eat of this bread, you declare the Lord's death until he returns. Shall we together partake of the cup, a symbol of Christ's blood that was shed for us on the cross? And so, our Heavenly Father, we come together as a congregation this morning to celebrate the sacrifice of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ on the cross. We celebrate that it took such a huge price for us to belong to the body of Christ. And today, it's not of our own doing that we are part of the body. It is an act of love by our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ to die on the cross. And we say thank you. But Lord, as we leave today, we leave with a challenge to serve that body. We leave with a challenge to reflect the completeness of that sacrifice in the completeness of the body as we allow every single gift among us to operate. So Father, forgive us for those times that we have divided the church by our competition and we have put others down because of their gifts and help us together exalt and uphold every gift that you've allowed to operate in our midst and enable us, O oh God, to allow them to operate fully. Father, for everyone that has made a commitment this day, we seal that commitment and we ask that, Lord, would you help us be faithful to serve sacrificially and to fully represent the sacrifice that you made on the cross for our sins. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the love of God and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, amen.